Hello everyone and welcome to Realism Overall Sandbox in Kerbal Space Program 1.3.1 and this episode I'm testing the Shinkansen space plane in its intended role as Earth to Moon transfer vehicle and seeing how it returns from the moon using multiple aerobraking braking passes through Earth's atmosphere. So I'm just trying to figure out what altitudes are good and how many passes it's going to need and making sure it doesn't stay too long in the radiation belts because that's something we definitely do not want to do. Uh, so the space plane is currently being carried up by its carrier plane. The carrier plane is currently the one on top which is full of fuel. The other side has the Kerbals in and some cabin space and it's not full of fuel. Uh, the space plane has the bigger engines, the big nozzle engines, but they're the same thrust as the engines on the carrier plane. If you've seen my rocket science videos, you know all about these planes and the engines by now. But just in case you haven't watched those, um, yeah, uh, they're about a thousand kilonewton thrust a piece on the engines, and these big nozzle ones uh, burn methane and oxygen and have an ISP of 373 in vacuum. The ones without the big nozzles, the sea level ones, have 343 in vacuum. So here we are throttling down, and right now it's carrying two crew, it's meant for four, with lots of cabin space, more cabin space than the space shuttle does, though sort of in a different configuration, it's longer rather than as tall, it doesn't have two decks the way the space shuttles did. Okay, so here we're making orbit, but we're gonna have to refuel this in orbit before it can get to the moon. So it's got enough tank space so that it can have 6,000 meters per second, which is way more than enough to get to the moon and do rendezvous and uh, get back home safely. But to refuel it, we're going to use this rocket, which is the Sagita Super Heavy. This is the first time I'm launching this. Uh, in previous videos, I've shown the Sagita rocket, which is a single stick, and the Sagita Heavy, which is uh, one single stick with two boosters. This with four boosters has a capacity to orbit of about 60 tons. It's roughly the size of a Falcon Heavy uh, in this configuration. And like everything else that you're going to see, it's burning methane and oxygen. So I have baseline to methane and oxygen all the way. RCS thrusters, vernier thrusters, everything is using the same fuel and oxidizer uh, for simplicity's sake. Now here the core ignites in flight when there's four boosters. With the Sagita Heavy, it does not ignite in flight, it ignites on the ground. And the four boosters go off a la Soyuz. Uh, they are not recoverable at this point, though maybe I'll think about that, but right now we're going for mass production here. Lots of using of the same engine and using of the same tanks. In fact, the tank carrying the fuel for the space plane is merely a duplicate of the upper stage of this rocket. So it's just another one of those stages. The rocket can carry that stage in full. The first stage and boosters of the Sagita rocket, of course, use the same engines as the carrier plane that you saw earlier, and this is the same engine on the space plane. At the top of this and on the space plane, I've placed my propellant-only docking ports, which I also did a video on explaining the details of, except these are different. Uh, based on feedback that I got from people, I decided to add into the propellant-only docking port a circular ring frame that was titanium and also uh, flat plates uh, connecting to the hinges that are also titanium and thereby adding more support to it and adding more mass. It basically, it doubled the mass of the propellant-only docking port and hopefully now it will seem more legit to people. Uh, it's at 84 kilograms at this point. It's still fairly small as you'll see as we approach the space plane and dock. Uh, it's not physically very large, but it is just meant to latch on while three pipes connect. So, yeah, hopefully it is sufficient. The existing propellant-only docking port in Realism Overhaul is not too different. It's about 100 kilograms. So here we are docking. Actually, I used the space plane to do most of the maneuvers once we got close because the RCS thrusters on the other side were not very well... Well, for some reason that I don't understand, they weren't working very well. So I decided to let the space plane do most of the business. The RCS thrusters, the conformal RCS thrusters on the delivery vehicle uh, are only 100 newtons apiece. So pretty weak. 
Anyway, that successful delivery of over 50 tons of fuel, which leaves the space plane with 4,000 meters per second already, which means even with just one refueling trip, it is ready to go to the moon and make orbit, but we want it to have fuel to come back. We want it to have its full 6,000 meters per second, so we need to do one more refueling trip. The space plane was sized so that it could be refueled on one trip by either SLS or by uh, BFR ITS, uh, Starship, whatever SpaceX is going to call it next, um, uh, assuming that Starship can carry 100 tons to orbit. So, uh, basically 100 tons will refuel it uh, to nearly 6,000 meters per second, and for this rocket that takes two trips. And for Falcon Heavy in non-reusable mode, it would also take two trips. So, whenever you see me use the the Sagita Super Heavy, you can think of it as having a payload capacity similar to a Falcon Heavy in non-reusable mode. Um, the Sagita Heavy, uh, with just the two boosters, that would be about the same as a Falcon Heavy in reusable mode. And then the single stick Sagita is probably equivalent of a regular Falcon 9 if it's landing on the barge. I think that's about right. Now Delta V is obviously not going to be a problem for the space plane on this because we are giving it 6,000. We need 3,200 meters per second to transfer to the moon, 800 to make orbit around the moon, 800 to break out of orbit around the moon, so that's 4,800 altogether. And then the rest of the 1,200 is basically spare because we're just going to be using Earth's atmosphere to cycle back down, hopefully in three orbits, but we'll see. And uh, again, we want to limit the number of orbits we need to pass through the atmosphere because otherwise the Kerbonauts, astronauts, are gonna get a lot of radiation out of that. But there is one problem. You know, we have a surplus of Delta V, but I didn't put any fuel cell on the space plane. Instead, I just packed batteries with 14 days worth of power. That's gonna come and bite us in the end. I didn't pack fuel cells because of course we're using methane and oxygen, not hydrogen and oxygen. And I'm sort of debating whether I'm going to instead put in a methane and oxygen generator. So that's one thing. Also, in this second trip of the refueler, you might have noticed food, water, and oxygen. I'm topping that off because with the first refueler, we took four days to rendezvous with the space plane. And so since the space plane only had 14 days of food, water, and oxygen as well. Uh, they depleted that, and so I decided to bring some up. Technically, that's not legal because the the pipes on the propellant-only docking port do not transfer food, water, and oxygen. They just, well, technically, they do uh, transfer oxygen, at least liquid oxygen. But uh, yeah, so that was a little bit of an exception to the general rule there uh, for this test. Mainly, I was trying to test how it would um, capture down into a low Earth orbit after coming back from the moon. So that was the goal. Finally, we have our transfer to the moon here. As you can see, below 3,200 meters per second is the cost. And 3,200 meters per second is a typical budget for a lunar transfer. With the main engines, it doesn't take very long. Uh, this does have OMS engines. They only have uh, efficiency of 360 seconds of ISP. Uh, the main engines are set to 12 ignitions max. Uh, the OMS engines have much, much more. So here we go approaching the moon. And initially I wanted to make the burn to capture around the moon using the OMS engines so that we can save the main engines uh, to just do the translunar injections each time. So basically, the main engines get lit on launch, and then they have the capability to do 11 translunar injections before the space plane comes back down for servicing. Basically, that's the cycle. And in total, it could do like maybe one trip to the moon a month, like that. And then at the end of the year, come back home. But ultimately, the OMS engines are taking too long. I didn't leave enough time for them to do the burn, so I lit the main engines to capture, as you saw there. And then stowed them again. They have the extendable nozzle, and we have to stow them before entering Earth's atmosphere in particular, because otherwise they'll be sticking out. Okay, so here we are around the moon, and now it is a matter of returning. 
In principle, this has the same heat shielding that the space shuttle did, so there's no way it can come straight back down to the ground from a lunar transfer, and so we're not aiming for a periapsis that can do that. Instead, we want a periapsis that will be heat safe for it, which is fairly high in the atmosphere, and I tested out 90 kilometers initially, and that didn't do enough to bring our orbit down, so here I'm going for a little under 80 kilometers. Uh, normally the shuttle would actually have a negative periapsis when it lands from low Earth orbit and um, Normally when I fly the shuttle in realism overhaul I aim for about 40 kilometers So that's what you need to get to the ground from low Earth orbit if you're flying a shuttle with all its lift um, So the reason why we're using a space plane for all of this is because it is able to retain its transfer stage the service module stage and it has this huge surface area to bring its orbit down using drag, and it doesn't need to go very deep into the atmosphere to do that. Uh, I did decide to keep a very steep pitch, a 70 degrees there, you see. I don't know if that's the best thing or whether I should have gone with just a 45 degree, but I think the steep pitch is best, and it's wiggling a little bit. That's about the limit of what the RCS is doing right now, but that's all down to balance between the nose RCS tanks and the tail RCS tanks. You can see the drag there. I also tried to do a novel maneuver flipping backwards as we were going up just to see if that was possible. You can see the remaining delta V down there, which is more or less what I expected, 1,200 meters per second or so. Well, a little bit less than that because we were using the RCS and everything. And that is the orbit we initially captured into. That's the first pass. And so here we're going in for a second pass. That first pass wasn't the greatest, I have to say, but if you had noticed, it was indicating that the space plane was overheating at, and you can see the overheating indicator again there, starting up. We could potentially go a little bit lower, but not too much lower. And yeah, certainly not low enough to come straight down into low Earth orbit on a single pass. That would be too much. So here we go, wiggling. But the problem is I'm running out of electric charge. I may know that we are on batteries all the way and I haven't figured out the fuel cell situation yet. So I needed to use the engines to try and bring that orbit down a bit, and now we need to basically save this uh, with another launch. And so I decided to launch the Lynx spacecraft, which I showed in one of the rocket science videos previously. And uh, in this case, we're launching it uncrewed because we didn't need crew. In fact, we didn't really need the crew cabin. All we needed was the shell that covers the top of it. Uh, the crew cabin isn't really going to be useful for this. All we really want to do is hook it up to the space plane to use the solar panels on the service module and also transfer some extra methane and oxygen as necessary. We certainly didn't need the launch escape system either, but you know, when it comes to these systems, you want to mess around with it as little as possible. But yeah, dumping the crew module inside of that shell would have probably been a good idea. Anyway, here we are on the upper stage. In the previous video, you saw this upper stage launch this spacecraft to the moon, so it can certainly rendezvous with the space plane in Earth orbit. And I sort of left it in a lopsided orbit there that turned out not to be very beneficial. Uh, you can see its apoapsis is on the wrong side. Uh, we hadn't actually brought the space plane into a full orbit yet. It was still partly suborbital, so I finished that up and made sure that it was in a safe orbit, and then started the rendezvous burns. Uh, this stage basically needed all of its fuel in order to do the rendezvous burns. We did one burn at uh, close to the Earth, and then another one up here mainly correcting the inclination here and I decided to make sure we disposed of that stage properly so you can see it's got a low periapsis and the service module boosted itself and the spacecraft back up again and we did a whole lot of burns to be honest to rendezvous with the space plane and here we are with docking if I had a full-size docking port that Kerbals slash astronauts could get through, we could have just used the Lynx spacecraft to bring them back down if we wanted to, but I didn't see a particular reason for that. I wanted to continue 
bringing the links uh, the space plane back down to a low Earth orbit, and so at least one more pass to see how that works out. I transferred the surplus fuel from the service module there into the forward RCS tanks on the space plane, and then this deorbited itself. It's job done. It'd be a lot cheaper if we didn't have the crew cabin inside of that shell, though. Anyway, but uh, here, this goes back into a suborbital trajectory. We pass through the atmosphere one more time at about 80 kilometers. A little bit lower than that, 77, I think I said it to. And we ended up at 78 because of the pitch creating some lift. And it was a two hour orbit by the end of that pass, so that's three passes. And I decided to go through once again at a somewhat higher periapsis. And that got us to a somewhat better level, at least enough that the engines would be able to finish up the whole business. And basically I brought it into an altitude equivalent to that of the International Space Station. Now one nice thing about doing all these passes is that you can work out a rendezvous with a space station, which is the intention with this, and it would be service at the space station, and then launched back to the moon. So with that, thank you for watching this explanation of the Shinkansen system, and I'll see you next time.